Lord, as we come to open the Bible this morning, we ask that the mantle of your presence will increase upon each one of us. Lord, that you might give us eye salve. Lord, that we might see something that we need to see. Lord, that you will open our ears, that we might hear something that we need to hear. Lord, for we are in your house and amongst your family, the family of God. And as we sit at your feet, Lord, and we we do entreat you, Lord. Lord, to feed us on the bread of heaven. Encourage us and equip us for the times ahead, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. It's good to be in God's house this morning. It's good to be under the sound of the word of God. I don't know about you, but I was listening to politics through the weeks. Most people are. and Some of the th- things that dawned on me in a kind of profound way was that many of the rulers that we have now have not got a clue about the scriptures. And uh, this is something that comes upon our society subtly. You know, it is um, people who are godless replace people who have come from a godly generation. The very basic precepts of what God has given are completely missing. I'm looking at something about that lady in New Zealand who sadly had the job to lead a nation in mourning because of the wickedness that happened in that country. And when I looked more at her, it turned out that she had at one time been a Mormon and she had forsaken that and is now a secular humanist. And she finds herself leading the nation of New Zealand in the Islamic prayer, which... It's the sadness what happened, but that's not a prayer we want to pray, because it's not true. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, who has been declared. And society, like our own, has prospered and strengthened and went to great things, because there was a foundation, which was in the Bible and Scripture, in the Ten Commandments, and even in the nation of Scotland, uh, I noticed something there about one of the, I'll not mention names, but one of the people in government who basically used up his opinion while he basically admitted he did not understand or know about what the Christian opinion was. It is ignorance that's abounding. The mayor of London confessed this week he didn't know what was in the Bible. He didn't know what was in the Bible. And you know, I felt so sad, I said, God, it's, it's our fault. We as a church have allowed this to happen. When the, when the place of prayer should have been filled up, we weren't there. We were busy with other things. We need to pray for our land because we now have people who have got their hands on the steering wheel who don't have the benefit of what we have this morning, the Word of God. Because they have never chosen to know read or understand what God has to say. Uh, I did mention some time ago I was I contributed in a debate and a discussion and uh, it was about things they wanted to introduce to teach children which were totally abominable according to scripture and they were asking for people's opinions and I said well what does God think? And the backlash I got was incredible. To actually suggest that God's got an opinion on anything. It's just a red flag to a bull in the society that we live in. What planet am I on that I actually think the creator of the universe has got anything to do with it? Well, I thank God I've met him. Hallelujah. Through Jesus Christ. And people want to live in darkness. That's sad. But to die in darkness and go into a dark eternity... For Jesus says there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, which is just an expression to say there is nothing but utter and total and endless and continuous despair. 
It comes about because people make these choices. Listen, we are the light of the world. And thank God we have scripture this morning. We have scripture which um, builds up our faith. And where are we in our scripture? Well, we've been looking at the, the minor prophets. And last Sunday I did speak on Zechariah, the second last book of the Old Testament. And uh, I found myself at the end of the, the running out of time. And I thought, you know, really, maybe we should have spent a wee bit more time in Zechariah before we moved on to Malachi. So here we are. We'll have another look at Zechariah then, shall we? Now, Zechariah 4, verse 6 is a verse that we all know in Pentecostal churches. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. So there we have it. We know. If it's going to be accomplished in this land, if there's going to be a returning, if there's going to be a, a redeemed society again, and that the Christian church will once more flourish, and men and women will have peace in their hearts, because they know their God, then it's going to be by the Holy Spirit. Not going to be by our eloquence, certainly not mine, or by our intelligence, it's certainly not mine. Or by our political prowess or contacts or manipulation or whatever we think that we are so good at. It's all going to be done by the Spirit of the living God. And that's what happened in the time of the Rubable. God brought a people back who were in captivity, who had been negated, who had been enchained, whose influence as the chosen people of God had been removed. But God's promises continued on. You know the name Zechariah means God remembers. Hallelujah. God remembers. And though uh, our influence and our obedience to the calls and dictates of the Lord might uh, wax and wane, God will not forget. You know there is a scripture in the Old Testament which talks about the um, shepherds who never did their job. They never did their job. And God said, listen, I'll raise up a shepherd in my own. But God still remembers and it comes back. And praise God, Zechariah means the Lord Yahweh remembers. And he did remember. And we read in this book, uh, Zechariah, a contemporary of Haggai. In fact, it was only about a month's ministry between Haggai and finishing up and Haggai and Zechariah taking up the baton as it were. Now Zechariah seems to be a much younger man and he carried on a long, long time in his ministry. It's interesting that his book is much longer than Haggai. And he had an awful lot to tell us and a lot to, which is messianic and prophetic and which was completely fulfilled because God is in this book. Praise God. Another thing about Zechariah was he was a member of a priestly family. Uh, and uh, there were others who were members of priestly families, uh, like Ezekiel and Jeremiah. But, you know, Zechariah uh, is used to bring about the, the um, prominence of the priesthood because they're moving up to a time where the prophet will be no more. There's going to be after Malachi, there's going to be a terrible silence. There'll be no more prophets. The word of God is silenced until John the Baptist turns up in the scene. But you know, even in uh, Zechariah 6, we read that uh, there's a symbolic coronation cer ceremony where Zechariah was commanded to make a crown of silver and gold. He got someone to make it and then he had to crown uh, Joshua, the high priest, Yeshua, same name as Jesus and he was crowned as high priest and also we can see that what's going to happen here this great priest king Jesus is going to come uh, Zerubbabel and Joshua have been anointed to be the two ones who will finish the work of God and bringing them back uh, and building the temple they're going to build the temple and they're going to complete the new temple that was destroyed there's a comeback hallelujah a revival and uh, also we noticed that in actual fact, until the time of John the Baptist, it was the priests who ruled the people of God. Some interesting things in Zechariah. And Zechariah prophesies that after the Jewish return, 
And during the restoration of Judah from Babylon, eh, that they would he would eh, prophesy under the leadership of Zerubbabel and Joshua. And of course, his prophecy is apocalyptic. There are eight strange visions in it, all sorts of strange things happening. He sees the men on horseback among the myrtle trees. He sees the, the woman in the basket, uh, which represents wickedness. And the, light, the lead lid is on, and two women with the wings of storks carry the basket away to Babylon. All sorts of strange things, but they have all sorts of good meanings. That God is on the move, and things are going to happen. Israel is going to be fully restored and restored under a royal and priestly leadership. Praise God! What is the, the book of the Bible all about? It's an encouraging book that God has a plan and a future for his people. Good promises, a restored kingdom and a functioning temple. Praise God for the prophecy of Zechariah. And then this divine king's earthly throne would lead to the salvation and restoration of many through the Messiah. And eventually, in times to come, times which we eh, might come after our time, the messianic kingdom will be established and wickedness will be relinquished from planet Earth once and for more. At the end, God will not allow sin to continue indefinitely. So let's carry on. Now, one of the most wonderful things is the... The flashes we get of the Easter story, eh, which are fulfilled in the Gospels, and these are wonderful flashes. We see Jesus eh, riding on a donkey. We see Palm Sunday. We read that in Zechariah 9, 500 years before it actually happened. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you. Righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. What a wonderful prophecy. As Jesus Christ fulfilled that and he came on that uh, Palm Sunday day into Jerusalem to fulfill the ministry of the Messiah. Then we see more flashes of Easter here. And he talks about that one that we read about when we were breaking bread. The one whose hand was on the table as Jesus uh, was uh, declaring that this feast, this memorial feast, the Passover feast, was actually representative of not just the lamb whose blood was put on the lintel on the doorpost in the time of the Exodus, but he was the lamb of God. And the blood of Jesus uh, would cleanse this world from sin. And he said, it was my, this, it's my body that's broken the bread. He said, and the cup is his blood. To shed, and the, but the hand of the one who would betray him was also on the table. And of course, we read prophesied 500 years about it, about the 30 pieces of silver that were paid. That was the price they paid for Jesus, and were thrown to the potter. The handsome price which they valued Jesus. The price that was, that was that, that 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 Judas put on Jesus, 30 pieces of silver. And of course, that echoes to us: what price do we put on Jesus? What price do we put on Jesus? And many a person has given up the faith for something cheap. You know, uh, Paul talked about Demas. He said, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present evil world. And I kind of warn us as people of God. If we read our Bible, we are warned all the time. The devil will continuously try to draw you back and take you away from your commitment, service, and following Jesus Christ. He succeeded with Judas. He succeeded with Demas, and I'll tell you, he stands at the door, trying to trip us up. And I, can I say something in my heart this morning? If ever we need people, you know, in politics, politics is a mess, and Theresa May will be standing up this, this week, and she'll be saying, now is the time for all good men to come to the aid of the party. That's a famous quote for politics, but I'm going to tell you something. Now is the time for all God's people to stand up and be counted. And don't let the devil blind your eyes. Think, well, that'll never happen to me. That happens to other people. The Bible says, Demas for so he what he he worked under the ministry of the apostle Paul. He saw miracles. He saw mighty things. He saw the hand of God. And yet, his love for this present evil world was the price he put on Jesus. 
What price would you put on Jesus this morning? Or do you love him so much that nothing is ever going to come between you and your love for the Lord? Oh, get to know him. Get to know him. Spend time with him. And get to know him. And here we have this prophecy about an Easter story about Judas. Not only that, it's interesting about the potter's field. We know what happened to the money. Throw it to the potter. Praise God. And then we more gumption of Easter. What are these wounds on your body? They were given in the house of my friends. Jesus Christ, he came his own, his own received them not, but to as many as received them, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. He came to his own people and they crucified him. They crucified him. And they received these wounds in the house of his friends. We read the story which takes us to Gethsemane in the same chapter in Zechariah 13, that they would strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And it's referred to the fact that when they took Jesus, all of those whom he had discipled over the three years of ministry, they gave up and fled. They gave up. One of them even betrayed him. He denied him with curses. But thank God for the restoration. They all came back. And they went forward after Pentecost. We go back to our opening verse. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. We're not going to do anything in this generation without the spirit of the living God. And these men, when they launched the church into its inception, they did it by the power of the Holy Ghost. The power of the Holy Ghost. Be filled with the spirit, the Bible said. Be filled with the spirit. When's the last time you could actually say, God is filling me with his spirit. Jesus told you to get into the private place and shut the door. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. You know, you think, oh, you come to the church and it's got to be done there. Read your Bible. Let your vessel be filled. The Bible says in Ephesians, be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. When we get in fire for God, we live in the Spirit. The Bible says if you live in the flesh, you'll fulfill the lust of the flesh. But when we live in the Spirit, praise God, we do the will of the Father, as Jesus did. You just take the model of Jesus, and we're told to be like him. He walked that path. He walked a lonely path. Before, even before the sun got up, he was up. He was seeking the, the will of his Father. He spent a great time in prayer, and even the Gethsemane we've been talking about. When the disciples fled, when the, when the temple guard came to arrest Jesus, they were actually wakened up because Jesus said, could you not watch and pray with me for an hour? They fell asleep. They fell asleep. You know, when the Son of Man comes, well, they find us sleeping. We need to be alert. We need to be aware. We need to be sensitive to what God is doing and what God is saying and what part each one of us has to play. In this dark, in this dark, sad world that we are, How, who knows? You might win a soul to Christ today if you're alert to what the Spirit is saying to you. If your spirit is slumbering, if you are caught up in fleshly pursuits, then you might miss the call. You might miss the call. I could give you testimony times when I've missed the call, and God knows I've repented of it in my heart. God was trying to tell me to do something and I couldn't hear it because there were other sounds in my ear that were claiming my attention. Or that we might be tuned in to what God is saying. We might follow him and be filled with the Holy Spirit. What is God telling you to do? What is God saying to you? Not, not what's a good idea. What uh, makes you look spiritual or is a spiritual thing to do. What is God actually telling you to do? So Samuel said to, the, to King Saul, Obedience is better than sacrifice. God's not wanting your sacrifice. He's not wanting your sacrifice. He's wanting your obedience. And if obedience requires sacrifice, that's a secondary issue. That's a secondary issue. The first issue is obedience. And you know what Jesus said when the, his first miracle, when he started to do his ministry and he emerged as he doing the will of the Father, his mother said at, the, at, the, at the, the wedding at Cana, whatever he says to you, do it. Do it. Know what Jesus is saying. Zechariah 12 tells us something about what we've been celebrating this morning, that we are now in the day of grace. And I will pull out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. 
and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. And here we have the gospel emerging 500 years before Jesus has actually been crucified. They will look on him, the one they have pierced, and they did. He was lifted up high for all to see. And as Paul said to King Agrippa, this was not done in a corner. This was done publicly. And the whole world was talking about it, the known world. About this man who had been crucified, who raised the dead, who healed the sick, who made the blind to see. And he said, I will pour out a spirit of grace on the house of David, the Jewish people, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. A spirit of grace and supplication. And this death, as we remember this morning, was actually the opening up of the day of grace. We moved into the day of grace. Up to then, people were keeping the law by their, their, their daily sacrifice, their annual sacrifice, or their special sacrifices for different occasions. But now the Lamb of God had been slain. This only child, for God gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Hallelujah! They'll grieve bitterly for him, as one grieves for a firstborn son. <coughs> there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. There was no other. This was God's plan. Spoken 500 years at this point, before it actually happened, they're going to gaze on him. And a, a spirit of grace and supplication. Supplication is another word for prayer, by the way. Prayer. How do you get saved? Do you keep all the laws to get saved? No, you cry out to God and you look upon the one whom your sins have pierced. What held him on that cross? Was it the wickedness of the envy and jealousy of the Jewish leaders? Was it the tyranny of the, the Romans who wanted to express their authority? Was it, or was it the misguided leadings of the common public who cried, crucify him, give us Barabbas? What put him on that cross? It was your sin that put him on that cross. And my sin put him on that cross. And we must look on him. And we cry, God, God, I'm sorry. I, my sin put you there, but I'm glad I put you there. Because if you did not die for me. Remember once listening to a man giving a talk on this. And he felt God was saying to him, he was having the most profound vision of the sufferings of Christ. And I say to you, we have a problem in this church. We have communion every week. And there is a danger that you can become familiar with what you're doing. Some people maybe only do it quarterly or, or whatever. And it becomes a very, very focused uh, thing. But we do it weekly and so there is the danger that we can become just almost mechanical about what we are doing but we must look upon the one whom we have pierced and our spirits must rise to him and say Lord my sin put you there my sin put you there and this man as he was giving this talk he said that one day he was praying and some people have been converted and contemplating the death of Christ. I know when I was a child, when I contemplated the death of Christ, it had a profound and deep spiritual impression on me. And later on came to fruition when I was converted. I was touched by the death of Christ. I was touched by it. And we're coming up to the Easter season. We're coming up to have a mission in this church where we can... Listen, can I say something? People are ignorant of the death of Christ. We're living in the age of ignorance. You know, I was at, um, heard a good quote the other day. I think it was uh, one of the great preachers. This man came up to me and he says, I have no interest in what you're saying. He says, I am an agnostic. And I think it was Spurgeon and he says, to him, well, he said, Spurgeon said to him, agnostic is a Greek word. Uh, it's a Greek word, he says. There's another word for that Greek word in another language, in Latin. It says the Latin word, which is the same word as, uh, as agnostic, is an ignoramus. <laughs> You're an ignoramus then. No, I'm an agnostic. It's the same word. An agnostic is one who says, I do not have that knowledge that there is a God. You see? The atheist is different. He, he says, there is no God. But the agnostic says, I do not have that knowledge. And in Latin, the word is an ignoramus. So you're an ignoramus then. He didn't like that. 
Well, they are ignoramuses. The world is full of ignoramuses. I don't know if that's the right way, word for the plural, is it? Doesn't sound right somehow. M to do Latin. But there's a lot of people out there who don't even know that Jesus died for them. Me need to wake up. I, I'm waking up to it this week when I heard three politicians basically admit from their positions of power they haven't a clue what the Bible teaches. But they're leading the flock. Where are they taking them? Where are they taking the flock? It's like, you know, the Pied Piper, isn't it? He's taking them in to destruction. We follow on gladly, skipping and laughing, with our eyes closed to the precipice we're about to fall off. God help our nation. But listen, we are the children of light. Try it. Try talking to somebody and say, what do you know about the gospel? You may actually find that when you open up a door, people will go, is that true? He died for me. Hallelujah. So we have this wonderful pa passage, and this is where I'm really coming to. Uh, what I want to talk about is this verse here. On that day a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. If that's not the gospel, what is it? On that day, as she's spoken prophetically 500 years. Now that's not coincidence. That's because God wrote this book. You can show people it. You say, can I show you something? This was written 500 years before Jesus was crucified. We were singing that earlier on, when I saw the cleansing fountain. Praise God for the, the, the fountain. You know, the fountain is a living source. I don't know if you know much about Islam. Muslims, before they pray, they have to wash themselves. And one of the commands that they were given was they can't use still water. They've got to have pouring water. That's why a lot of these, if you go to the Middle East, a lot of these, um, uh, where they pollute themselves, they, it's a place of a fountain because the water is actually pouring. And this isn't a stagnant pool for the blood of Jesus. This is a living, continuous, eternal fountain that cleanses us from our sins. A fountain will be opened to the house of David. That we might cleanse ourselves from our sin and from our iniquity. That we might be washed and made clean. The fountain. There is a fountain. Filled with blood. Drawn from Emmanuel's veins. That sinners cleansed beneath its flood. Lose all their guilty stains. You know we need to tell people they need to get their sins forgiven. When my father was dying I said to him. Father. I didn't say father. I called him da all my life. I said da. You need to get your sins forgiven. You need to get your sins forgiven. And he says, I know. And I prayed for him. And he asked Jesus to take his sins away in his deathbed. We need to tell people they need to get their sins forgiven. And here we have this prophecy. There is a fountain. There is the day of grace has been declared on that day. That day of grace and supplication. Do you know, whatever's going on in the world, whether we leave Europe or stay in Europe, and goodness knows, the prophets are all arguing among themselves. Did you hear about that? In the charismatic churches, some prophets are saying we're going to leave, and some prophets are saying we're not going to leave. Anyway, we'll see what happens, but irrespective of what day we are living in and how much the persecution works out, can I say something? We are still in the day of grace. The door of the ark is still open. You know what I'm talking about? Noah and his ark. That door was open and they wouldn't come in. They laughed and they mocked and they scoffed and they wouldn't come in but the door was open. And if they came in, they would have been saved. Tell people the doors are open because one day, the Bible says with Noah, God shut the door. The day of grace will draw to an end. It's interesting we're studying Revelation at the moment because we're looking into future events. This day will not always be this day. This day will become tomorrow. And it will be a different day. 
Be glad, church. Be glad that you're in the day of grace. Be glad that you can tell someone you can have your sins forgiven. There is a fountain that takes your sins away. Praise God. Now, the last chapter of Zechariah is a very interesting chapter, and I'm going to briefly talk about it. In Zechariah 14, the Lord will be king over the whole earth, and that day there will be one Lord and his name, the only name. This is prophetic beyond this day. This is into the rule of the Messiah, when Jerusalem again will be restored, and the king, this king who was prophesied when that crown was put on Yeshua, the high priest, this priestly king, will sit on that throne, and that uh, reign. There will be one Lord and his name is the only name. This is Zechariah we're reading here. We sing that about uh, he is Lord, he is Lord. He's risen from the dead and he is Lord. There's only one name by which we can be saved. We read in the, in the book of Acts. At the name of Jesus. Then we read in verse 16, Then the survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem. This is at the end of time. When wickedness and sin has been defeated on this earth. They will go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, and to celebrate the Festival of Tabernacles. Now, this is very interesting, and I've not got much time to talk about it, but let me just fill you in a wee bit. There are three feasts that you go up to Jerusalem for. There is a, a Passover feast, then there is the, the Feast of Pentecost, and there is the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, there are other feasts. There's Shavuot, where they get married to the law and all the rest of it. But at this feast, people go... Uh, and they remember how they were strangers in a foreign land. They were out there living in booths out in the desert, Sukkot, they call it. They lived in these temporary uh, structures. And during this festival, they build temporary booths. They still do it today in Jerusalem on their verandas and in the back gardens. And they pray in them, they decorate them with all sorts of fruit and colours. And they're able to see the stars at night. They might remember where they came from. That's what we do when we break bread. We remember what we came from, that we came from our sinful state. But I tell you this, and I'll just say this in closing, there's so much could be said about this Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles is the only one where they then bring in all the strangers of the world. It is an opening to the whole world and it goes beyond the house of Judah. And if this doesn't speak about the Lord's reigning over all the earth, it talks about all these nations have attacked Jerusalem. They will come and they will bow the knee and say, He is Lord. This goes beyond the Jews. This goes to all who come and who are blessed. Now, so much because said about the festival of tabernacles, and I would encourage you to study, study your Bibles and learn what this is all about because it's fascinating. This declaration. Praise God. They were to begin in Jerusalem and then in Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the world to take this knowledge that Jesus Christ is King. He is Lord. Hallelujah. God is good all the time. All the time God is good and there's coming a time when he shall reign on this earth. But thank God he reigns in our hearts today. Are you glad you're a Christian this morning? Praise God. We're going to close our service with this song here which I hope uh, echoes what I'm trying to say this morning. I'd rather have Jesus in silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches unfold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses and lands. I'd rather be led by his nail pierced hands. Praise God. Let's consecrate ourselves to Christ as we sing this song. Remain seated as we uplift the Lord's offering. Hallelujah. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be him than have riches on. I'd rather have 